Hello everyone, happy Friday. It's me and I'm back and I'm absolutely crazy. <laughs> so I saved a very special video for you uh, to complete my fifth day of seven days. The camera angle is slightly different. I'm closer to you <laughs> so you can see more of my imperfections. <laughs> and um, I wanted you to be closer to see these items. So hopefully the camera is okay for you to see all of this. I wish I could back it up a little bit because I have two leaded lamps I want to show you. Well, a leaded lamp and a slag panel lamp. And then I have five vases to show you. And then we're going to go over to the light box for a fancy show and tell of some brooches and pins that I have loved for a very, very, very long time. Um, so first things first, I want to send out a special thank you to Thelma at Thelma Thrift. If you don't know about her channel, please go over to Thelma, like and subscribe. You will not be let down. She is an amazing bright light and truly has become a friend of mine and someone that I had looked up to for a very long time. I went on and I had an interview with Thelma not too long ago. And if you go to my community tab, you just go over across the top of all these different videos and you see the community tab, click on that and go down a little bit. And the link to my interview with Thelma is on there on the community tab. Please click on it and go see that video. She did an amazing interview with me that awakened my artistic spirit, that awakened my artistic heart. And I received this amazing box in the mail. She sent me friend mail. She sent me a beautiful card and she sent me a wonderful piece of Native American art pottery. Thelma, thank you so much. I really um, couldn't believe your generosity. She also sent me this incredible book on what was then considered contemporary folk art in America. And this book, I have so many books in my library, and this is one of the books that I don't have. And the environments in which these artists and untrained artists created to live in and to function in, and some of their sculptures, I highly recommend you get a copy of this book, because look at some of these amazing sculptures that were done by artists who were driven by their heart, who weren't necessarily trained, and we're driven to create based on feeling the necessity to do those things. And I wish I could find the other one in here that I just saw the other day because this book has already inspired me. Um, so, Thelma, thank you so much. Uh, and the book is from, I think it's from, let me make sure I tell you right. Yeah, it's, it was copyrighted in 1975. So just a year after I was born. <laughs> Incredible. That um, 49 years ago and, and such an inspiration. So, Thelma, thank you so much. Okay, on to the art pottery on the desk before I knock it over. I'm on a much more secure desk because I'm in my, my nest, in my comfort zone. And this is a piece of Muncie pottery, M-U-N-C-I-E, Muncie pottery. It's arts and crafts. It's a pure form. The glaze is frothy and beautiful. And again, the viscosity of the glaze totally planned out, but Mother Nature then took over. So the artists on only went so far and then Mother Nature controlled the rest of this. And the mark on the bottom, let me make sure I face it the right way for you. There we... Okay, let me make sure I face it that way for you. Right there, it's signed Muncie, M-U-N-C-I-E, Muncie Pottery, one of the most prolific in terms of arts and crafts or mission-style pottery, but that one was right around, I think, around the late 20s, early 30s, and I think more maybe 30s than 20s on, on that specific base. Um, on to one that is more contemporary, but just an extraordinary example and a very special example of crystalline glaze vase. It's on a porcelain clay body, so that is porcelain. It's signed on the bottom, and it's by Campbell, so let me show you that. Now, that Campbell signature is more contemporary. This piece is from 2015. When you see earlier Campbell works, earlier pieces constructed by him, they will be script signed Campbell right into the pottery base. So they're not stamped like that. They actually almost graffito or incised into the, the porcelain clay body. But I had to bring that on for an example of crystalline 
glaze vase. And if you love this one, please go to my past videos and also some of my short feeds have featured some more of the crystalline glaze pottery vessels that I have in my collection. So please go view those. This is a purist arts and crafts, beautiful society painted, hand decorated and glazed vessel. And this is American. It was produced in America around 1907. I believe this is 1907 or 1915. Anywhere between those two dates. It's signed by the artist. And again, an untrained artist that was learning how to paint in a higher, shall you say, society, uh, society, uh, women, higher class that wanted to learn how to glaze and paint pieces. So as an untrained artist, this arts and crafts almost transitional into Art Nouveau and Art Deco. It's right in between those. So, you know, I challenge people like myself and other dealers, you know, is this Art Nouveau? Is this Arts and Crafts? Is this Art Deco? It's got all of that going for it. So I would consider this in its purest form an Arts and Crafts aesthetic vessel. And look at the size of it. The color choice, blue, purple, mint green, turquoise, just absolutely beautiful and so well done. So well done. I'm going to set this over here because I'm going to run out of room again. So we're going to put her way down at the end. And then we're going to go with these last two. These are both crystalline glaze. And this one is by, let me refresh my memory here. I haven't looked at these in a while. They're so dirty. This is by, she's a female ceramic artist, uh, Brendler. And I don't, it was Linda Brendler. I believe it was Linda Brendler. And it's signed on the bottom and it's dated 1985. But the reason I bring this on is look at its nod. You know, it's nod and it's uh, appreciation to the arts and crafts piece that I just moved over there that I struggled to find on this side. But it's, it's so reminiscent of an antique or a vintage piece. But look at this spikiness of the glaze and then these crystals that so carefully grew into these large blossoms of color, almost like fireworks or frost on a winter window. But that is absolute beautiful, beautiful goodness. And I've owned this one for around 20, I want to say 21 or 22 years. This has been with me. And this was an acquisition from an estate sale. Back then, even though it was beautiful, I think it was only $12 or $15. And now I wouldn't sell this for any less than $300 or three and a quarter, and probably maybe even $375. So uh, without being too greedy, because it's definitely worth it. Boy, look how tired I look today. <laughs> it's my eyes. I am tired. It was it was quite a long day. But you are what recharge me. You are what gets me right back to where I need to be. Let me unzip this a little bit because I'm getting uh, all hot and bothered. <laughs> uh, this one is, again, porcelain clay body. I didn't figure out the artist on this one. Um, maybe this is a Campbell. I'm going to have to do a little bit more research on that, but that also looks like, well, nope, it's going to be all flashed out. Maybe I'll hold it there. It looks like Campbell's signature because it's, it, it's all, it's almost there. I think it might be a Campbell, but look at how this was treated with these applied zigzags to create channels for the glaze to, to drip and to grow these crystals. But the crystals and the color and the form of this vessel really made me happy. Uh, it it has these you know tight shoulders, tall taller neck, squatty form, and a wide foot that it sits on. So its form followed the patterning of of these squiggles and the glaze. It made a lot of sense that this artist created it this way, and you could tell that it's hand raised. You can look on the inside. Many time you feel down in there and you feel those raised ridges as I get my finger stuck in there. <laughs> you feel those raised ridges on the inside. That means that it is hand raised from a wheel. So this was hand raised and, and what a, a beautiful, beautiful form and, and beautiful size. Okay, now that that's over with, that's not why we're here, but oh, I'm going to scoot these out of the way as I, <laughs> as I reach for my other table in front of me. Look how challenged I am about trying to uh, get those over there. Okay. 
Uh, this lamp. I, I wish I could back out a little bit, but but I, I can't because I'm stuck behind the table. <laughs> um, and what we've got going on here is a panel lamp. It's just after the turn of the century, maybe around, oh, the, the, you know, these are, these are sometimes tough to date, but this is around 1915, 1920, uh, but not after 1920. And this one is a six panel shade. I don't want to go too much farther. I'll go that much farther for you. So it's gigantic and it's got this water lily or lotus blossom design, open work spelter shade as I get dust all over. I just blew dust all over myself. <laughs> so this has not been cleaned for a long time, but uh, this is making the move. So I did move this uh, from storage. And uh, it is making the move with me. It's a two socket fixture on the inside. So look up on the inside. See how the panels are in with these little stays that are all around. This shade is not signed. I, I could attribute this to a maker, but again, I just don't feel comfortable because there's so many different makers. Um, there's Wilkinson, there's Miller, there's Mosaic Glass, um, uh, let me, uh, Handel. Um, at the turn of the century, there's so many different makers of these, but look at the base of this as well. So you've got these kind of arrow plant uh, leaves on, on the bottom, and you've got a very weighted bottom there with this big steel plate that's on the inside. Now, let me s sneak this back all the way back here, and as I turn around it, and I'll light it up for you. Look how fantastic and how beautiful it is when the light is on. It's a double socket, and uh, it does cast this very warm and, and romantic light, but uh, one of my many panel lamps I think now I can safely say I'm down to um, nine. No, I just lied. <laughs> I'm down to 10 panel lamps. So I was up to approximately 30 of them, or it was like 35 uh, at one time. But um, this one is going to make the move. I loved its grace. I loved its elegance. And it's going to make the move with me. Now, on to... The last lamp, and then we're going to get into the light box to get this uh, fancy show and tell started. This one's gigantic. Um, this is a turn of the century leaded glass lamp. And it's leaded glass. And why you can tell this is an old one as opposed to a new one. Here, let me set it down here. <laughs> as opposed to, and I'm going to unzip this because... Um, I, my chubby belly <laughs> is in the way right now. Um, so, so, um, the, the way the shade is bent, okay, so this bent, this absolute bent panel here where the pieces are actually physically bent, that's a telltale sign that this is not a contemporary lamp, okay? The size of the shade and the coloration of the glass. When you get into newer leaded glass lamps that are contemporary and reproductions of the old ones, there's a finish difference, and you'll see it in real life. Also, you can see striations in the glass. You can see air pockets and imperfection. Also, this feels and sounds like glass. When you tap on the new ones, they're sometimes created out of acrylic pieces and panels. So tap on it and make sure it sounds like glass. And, you know, you can even kind of lightly tap your ring on it uh, just to make sure that that's actually glass and not plastic. This shade is absolutely beautiful. There's a couple cracked panels, a couple cracked pieces, I should say. Didn't really bother me. If you look up on the inside of this, the leading is also very, very, very complex. Look at that on the inside. Double socket. No, this is a triple socket. Sorry. There's a triple socket. I don't have a bulb in that back one. But um, look at that, and I'll try and get a little closer up. Well, let me set it down for one second and make sure that this cord doesn't wipe out my crystal clay's vases on that other side of the table. So um, there. There you go. So on the inside of that, you can see how that is constructed, and you can feel that there is a lot of... A lot of um, of material and leading on the inside. So it's substantial. That's the word I'm looking for, substantial. Look at the bottom. So look at that. So that is fantastic. The weight of this as well. The old ones, old, 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 like this, are very, 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 very heavy as I continue to struggle. The fitter caps are also old right at the top. I could take this off in another video and do a close-up of the shade, and I think I'm going to do that. I am going to light this up real quick. Oops. 
I'm going to light this up. Of course, I pulled the one where the bulb wasn't. I'm not going to put both bulbs on because I wanted to have that glow for you. But is that not the most beautiful, beautiful color and beautiful, beautiful flowers? Almost a dogwood because of the, the four petals. Pink, earthy, fantastic. The glow is gorgeous. The shade is fantastic. And I love the proportion of the shade on the base. And yes, before you ask, that base has absolutely, positively been painted over the years. And that does happen. So sadly, that's not the original color of the base. And um, I will shut it off now so we don't get um, overheated. I will tell you that please be careful, as I adjust myself again, because <laughs> I'm a fidgeter, um, please be careful with the wattage of the bulbs. Please do not go over ever a 40 watt bulb in any of these lamps. They just can't handle it. It's not advisable because then you'll start to heat up the spelter or you'll heat up the leading and you're going to have a major problem. And I don't want to say a technical meltdown, but a technical meltdown, <laughs> really. So um, thank you for bearing with me. Thank you for letting me show two of the lamps that I absolutely love. I will be bringing on more antique and vintage lamps and lighting. I do have a massive collection of 1950s lamps that I'm going to do kind of the, you know, normal show and tell, but like a parade of 1950s lamps. And the mixture of materials is unbelievable. The designs are whimsical and fantastic. So I was greatly, greatly, greatly uh, drawn to those. I, I was, my, my pull towards those was fantastic. Um, and I have a, a, it looks like a little white dot on my nose because I put lotion on my face. <laughs> Anyways, it looks like I have a white dot painted on the tip of my nose. <laughs> and now it looks like I'm drunk because I'm rubbing it. It's red. <laughs> Anyways, um, so here I go, <laughs> going crazy. Um, so this, this lamp, um, I don't know if I touched on value years ago. I think I paid $125 from an estate sale and I believe that I wouldn't let this go now, even in a depressed market, I wouldn't let this lamp in this size and condition and, you know, beautiful base. I wouldn't let this go for less than $750. Um, and that's not being too aggressive. Now, I'm going to hold you there. I'm going to try and get this rest of the part of the video done in about 25 minutes. I'm not going to rush, but I do have other things that I have to get done tonight. So, happy Friday. Thanks again for joining me. Wait one second. And I do not know how I'm going to get <laughs> from this table to that phone to shut it off. All right. Wait one second, okay? Hold on. Wait one sec. Mwah. Wait one minute. Okay, so you made it back to my light box with me. Here is the first of the enameled bug or insect brooches that I have courageously collected for many years. This is a David Anderson from Norway. It is sterling silver, and there's the DA mark, so anytime you see that, that's David Anderson. But look at the coloration of this amazing glass enamel just amazing. The gesture is beautiful. The coloration is beautiful. I'm going to show you a few more enamel. Um, let me grab this one next. And this is more characteristic of what you will see. The enamel is all one color, but look at how they carefully engraved the wings underneath the glass enamel. So they put these little lines and then these beautiful little dots, this little polka dotted design excuse me, <clears throat> on the wings and on the bottom wings. Again, look at the construction of this. Now, this one is a different maker. Let me take a look at that and see. Let me pause the video because I need a drink of water. Give me one second. I'm going to leave that there. Give me one moment. Oh, okay. So <laughs> I just took a drink of um, water. Thank you for the quick break. As to the hallmark on there, I'm not exactly sure... I used to remember this one. I'm going to have to look that one up. But an, um, an older style, just fold over or a simple C clasp and a tube hinge there. So remember, this is not Victorian. This is actually much, much later. But they used a very early technique to construct that pin, pin mechanism. So there's that. I'm going to take another drink of water. <laughs> Give me one second. Hold on. Mm-hmm. Okay. <clears throat> Now I feel refreshed. So look at this one. Electric blue and periwinkle. Absolutely 
beautiful and graceful. Look at the undulation of the wings and the bend in the wings and then this graceful antenna that are almost oversized. Again, this one's David Anderson and marked full on David Anderson. And it is sterling silver. And again, why I loved this one, the size of it, the grace of it, and the color. Now, there's a few other ones. I mean, I have, I, I probably have of enamel butterflies. I probably have around 70 or 80 of them. But um, I'm only going to bring um, only so many for this video because I just don't have the time to go over all of them. But we will have a parade of insects eventually. Um, so that one is beautiful, enamel sterling silver. Let me see what other one on the tray. Oh, we'll go with this one, and we'll go with this one, and we'll go with two more. So there's a monarch butterfly, and look at the little blue one. So these get smaller, but if you wear them, let me reach over and grab this one too. <laughs> we can't leave this one out. But if you wear them in groupings, I've always felt like they're they're meant to be worn um, in groupings, but that's just me and how I wore my things. Um, and I'll get into videos if you ever want me to get into videos on how I wear my items or how I group them, I would most certainly do that as well. So again, these pin mechanisms on this one look very, very old, like Victorian. They're not. They're from around the 1940s. Look at that because that is not a Victorian pin stem pin mechanism or a pin knuckle, if you will. And then just because it's got the simple rollover or the little C clasp, you know, they always say, well, that's Victorian. No, it's not. It's most certainly not Victorian. Um, and that has not been resoldered. So let's be clear on that. On the date on those, again, they're 30s, 40s, probably into the 40s on those two. So uh, 1940s. And then this one would be about the same. This is between the 40s and the 50s. But all Norwegian um, um, from Norway, all sterling silver. But look at the detail on the wings. So I'll just let you take that in for a second. Just beautiful, absolutely beautiful. And I think this collection was based on um, uniqueness and beauty. Let me return these to where they go on the tray because I like to keep track of things. Now I'll get into, nope, I'll do one more enamel. Um, yes, I'll do this one. Oh wait, I already did this one. No, I didn't. No, I didn't do this one. <laughs> uh, this is pink turquoise, white, and gray. And I really liked this. It was more reminiscent of a moth to me. Um, and I was always so in love with moths and so um, um, kind of, uh, what do I say? Uh, in trance, uh, like um, almost like in a trance when, when they would arrive um, in, in the uh, late spring and in, in the summer because they were always around the lights and um, just beautiful insects. Uh, so there's that. Okay. And then, okay, we're done with the enamels for right now uh, before I get completely sidetracked. Now, other insects and um, uh, other things that were enameled was this little bumblebee. Look how realistic. If you were to have that on an outfit, look how realistic that little bumblebee is with marcasites in its thorax and its little enameled head. But look how carefully enameled the wings are. And then they furthered this by kind of, what is that? Oh, it's part of the enamel. What do you know? Oh, I guess some of the enamel just chipped off. Yeah, it did. Oh, well, that's okay. I don't know how that happened. Just remember, enamel is very, very, very fragile. Just remember that. Glassy enamel, if it doesn't have a counter enamel, Enamel on it, which this doesn't. It's very, very fragile. So just remember that. Um, now, on to this. Look at the gradation in the wings and how they gradated the body. You know, it's this uh, very realistic, but look how small. Sterling silver and probably right around 1940, 1950, maybe into the 60s, but definitely not after the 1960s. Loved the little bumblebee. Now we're going to look at another enamel, which is a beetle. And I love my beetles, but the color of this and having the little green eyes and the marcasites in the little pinchers, remember about marcasites, they're very, very, very easy to lose. So there's two marcasites out right there and there. Now, the marcasites in the body have survived, be uh, survived because they're very carefully bead set. So when I talk about the bead setting, that means that those little pieces of metal are folded over the marcasite. So that's why those have remained, because the little bead setting has hold, held them in place. See, I start making mistakes when I rush, but I just get so 
excited to share. So if I calm down, I wouldn't be making nearly as many mistakes. So there is the mark there, sterling, and it's marked Germany. I believe it's German. Uh, let me see if I can turn that around. I think I'm upside down. I'm going to look at my loop real quick. I th always thought this was German. And uh, it is. It is marked U.S. zoned Germany. So that does give a more accurate dating uh, when it's U.S. zoned. Why cannot not hold still? Oh, I know why. Because, okay, I'm standing on one leg <laughs> like a flamingo. There we go. I put my leg down. Now, let's see here. Yep. There we go. U.S. zone Germany. Okay. So, U.S. zone Germany and it's gesture, it's energy, it's realism, uh, the color, you know, I, I loved it. And um, I still love it. And I, I, I adore that one. Okay. Now, um, something to change gears completely. We'll go with a few of the gold insects. And I have many, but these are the only two that I had out right now. So there's a little house fly. So that's a little tiny fly. And this is a bee with a ruby body and those are natural rubies again they lean pink so can we go with pink sapphire we can but i'm going to call them rubies <laughs> and then this i think is 18 carat or is it 14 carat uh, i can't read that i th always thought this was 18 carat well it doesn't matter because it's gold <laughs> so it's 14 or 18 and that one's from the late 1940s early 1950s why i show this is you will find a lot of these out in the wild and when you find these sometimes they're not marked gold now I have seen them reproduced lately that are sterling silver with gold vermeil just be careful that you don't get a sterling silver one with gold vermeil and buy it at a gold price okay so that one's gold and, and beautiful and I think when I bought that one look how little he is when I bought that one back in the day I think that was uh, 30 or $40. And now they're around uh, two, 250 to 275 for that one. If you get it with the diamonds um, body, uh, probably double that. And if you get it in the emerald or the sapphire, which they made all the different colors, uh, you can pay uh, approximately the same price for all of them. And then there's this one, the house flight. And why I loved this one, look at the enameled eyes. This is gold. The little flip down bail. So that flips up so you can wear this as also a necklace pendant and safely wear it as a necklace pendant. Look how small and miniature. Look at the detail on the legs and the feet and the pin stem. Look how tiny. I mean, it, it doesn't even doesn't even fill up the whole first uh, portion of my gigantic hands. And then what's the most beautiful part is it's actually plique azure. And that's plique azure enameling. So that is like little leaded windows. So that is enamel that doesn't have a back on it. So you can see through it like a leaded window. And that is plique azure enamel. And that's P-L-I-Q-U-E-A. J-O-U-R, Plique Azure Enamel, and uh, beautifully done. Um, and that one, I think that was 20, no, I think that was 10, yeah, that was $10. And again, I'd probably be able to get to the right collector, I'd be able to get around 300. Uh, well, maybe 250, 300. So we'll leave it at that, but really beautiful, beautiful. Absolutely love it. So we'll put that one down. Oh, you know what? We can't do it that way because then I'm going to lose track of where they go. That one goes there on the tray. See, I, I do have a method to my madness in my collection, and i got to keep things where they go. All right, more examples of plique azure. I will take them off one as a, at a time. Um, this one is an Art Nouveau original, right around 1900, 1900 to 1910. Um, Pin mechanism, very unusual on this one. So you've got a gold rivet holding that together. You have the hallmark down here at the end of the tail. And you have a very, very, very old and honest, simple C-clasp there. All right. The grace and the elegance of this. Now, the plicature is damaged. But what someone had done, and it's okay. I kind of forgive them. They actually knocked out a few of the cells so that it matched. But all of this would have been filled with glass enamel. Those are tiny little, those are red glass. Those are not garnets. Those are red glass eyes. And, you know, again, did I forgive it that the wings were damaged? Yeah, I do, because it's such a very fragile, fragile thing to have glass trapped 
in metal. But look at the construction on that. So again, if you're looking for old Plicageur and you're looking for old Art Nouveau original dragonflies, that would be an old one. Can it be restored? Yes. Have I restored Plicageur enamel? Yes. Is it difficult? It is one of the biggest challenges an artist or a restoration person will ever have in jewelry. It's very, very difficult. So what we have to do is back this uh, with a material, get into that, and then you fill this and then you fire it. But again, with these eyes, you'd have to take those out and you'd have to secure the whole body and the pin mechanism would likely need to be resoldered after you fire the enamel back in there. You can do it with cold enamel. You can do it with like a, a cold enamel, like an epoxy enamel, and that does work. So um, do I like to do it that way? No. Do I like to do it the original way? Yes. It's much more of a challenge, but it's um, historically correct. This one is also Plicageur enamel, um, and this one is in such good condition. Yes, there is one broken cell there, and there is a broken cell there, but look at this. And I think this is Marius Hammer. Let me see here. Yep, it's Marius Hammer. There's, there's the M, and there's the, uh, you know, the hammer through it. That's Marius Hammer. And then that is 830 silver. Uh, so it's not sterling, so it's 830 silver, Marius Hammer, easy, simple C-clasp, and then the tube hinge on that side, okay? Um, well, I loved this one. I loved the color combination. I love the green, and I did like the size of this one. I like the gesture of the front feet as well, and those tiny, cute little beady eyes. Isn't that adorable? All right, so as I continue to get a little bit more tired as we go, <laughs> um, oh, here's one more plea cajure. And I do have another one on the tray, but this is another Plicageur. And this one, uh, in, in such good condition, just really good condition. But look how new the clasp is. So that's maybe the late 1940s, yeah, late 1940s, 1950s. Um, it is verme, so this is not new. Um, a lot of these um, that are that are very, very new are made in China right now, but this is not a new one. This is definitely 40s, 50s, and I loved the little garnet eyes. So those are garnets, and I love the gesture. I love the segmented body, and it just looks so real. You know, like it could just, you know, land on your hand and then take off seconds later. Um, very magical, very beautiful, and again, having see-through enamel, uh, fantastic. I wish I could light these up. Let me see here. No, my, my flashlight's really weak right now. Uh, it feels like me. <laughs> it is, yeah, it, it's done. It needs new batteries. And I need to recharge as well. I really do. Uh, I know when I start to get this tired, I know that's when mistakes, you know, start to happen. So we'll stop with the plique azure, but there's more of those. And then we'll go into the Native American. This one's Navajo. Very, 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 very old. Very old. Uh, turquoise eyes just the grace and the gesture and look at the construction so completely hand fabricated out of separate pieces and then soldered together the gesture the grace the oxidation the stamping on the wings i absolutely love this pin and this would be a never sell this would be a jason forever uh, and you can see why so this is a classic example of what i would seek out now as like one of the best examples of a native american uh dragonfly pin so we'll leave him in there for a second because i know right where he goes on the tray and then look at the queen mother version so this is a butterfly this is also navajo each turquoise is completely hand bezel set. So each stone, look how the sizes vary, even from side to side, much more elliptical, much more chubby, much more, let's see here, much more round on this side, and then much more oval on this side. So each bezel was carefully made for those stones. And then the artist had to keep track of where those stones went. But look at the age and the color of the turquoise. You can tell those stones are not stabilized, they are not treated. You can tell the variance in color. You can tell the variance in matrix. Do I know where those stones came out of? I have suspicion of what mine that is. But again, I'm going to bring on a turquoise expert for a reason. Um, I want a turquoise expert to explain the different mines and how the mines and the stones oxidized over time because that has happened and then it lends itself to people misidentifying the mines that they come from. This is fantastic in construction. You can see the old solder in place. You can see the old pin mechanism. Um, sizable. Uh, again, if I found this half the size, I would be delighted. Finding it this gigantic, I was thrilled. And I love the secondary stamping just to kind of uh, define the body of the butterfly. Um, spiritually, 
there's something about this pin that spiritually really uh, touches a, a special place in, in, in my being. Um, I guess, um, I, I don't know. I don't want to say anymore because I don't want to ruin it. But uh, Navajo, that one, maybe 1920s. Mm, yeah, 1920s, maybe, maybe, maybe late 1920s, but I, I feel earlier 1920s, and it might even go into the 1915, 1918, um, early construction, uh, very, very early construction on that, and I'll, I'll let you take that in by itself. Uh, I'll return this other one to its place of prominence on the tray, uh, prominence, and uh, I'll let you take that in, because uh, I love it. I, I feel as though some of these things um, will definitely eventually be left to museums and, and this is probably going to be one of them um and i love it i just absolutely love it um value i just don't want to go there on that one uh this one is okay let's pull this one out um yeah okay i'll talk about it this one's um again maybe late 30s let me think here yeah oh yeah late 30s early 40s navajo for sure stamped by hand um these tools were definitely more commercially produced Loved the snake on the wings. Loved, loved, loved. I have a chart that I will go over eventually with the symbols and what they mean. God, I feel like a school teacher right now. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with it, but I feel like, I don't know, I feel like I just changed gears into like uh, uh, lecture series. <laughs> lecture series 101. Uh, this is a practical guide to get you out there in the field and to know what to buy and to know what to look for. Again, completely hand constructed. Uh, so we've got this part soldered to this part and then this cut out of a flat sheet and then the antenna are so graciously soldered on. Okay, so look at the construction of the way that's made. And again, the oxidation on the surface only really helps the authenticity of that and really accentuates uh, the stamping on the wings. And I, I love that one as well. So sizable, that might stay with me. Now, I have Mexicans, uh, Mexican versions of the butterfly and the dragonfly. I'll get to these for, oh, we'll, we'll do, well, see, okay, we'll do these two. So these are both Mexican, mother of pearl on this one. And then turquoise and set in this one. And these are definitely Mexican for sure. Um, it's probably signed Mexico. Oh, there you go. Silver Mexico. And then artist initials. So that's an earlier Mexican mark. So that's uh, pre, this one would be pre 1950s. So, uh, well, yeah, pre 1950s. Um, actually, actually, yes. And sizable sterling silver. Beautiful. So it could be late 30s, early 40s on that one. And then this one. I think this might be, this might be William Spratling. No, mm, not signed. It's a William Spratling design, but I think the other one that I have is William Spratling. But look how the mother of pearl is riveted to the sterling silver body uh, of, of the wings. And then this beautiful and graceful body to make that dragonfly look like it's going to take off. Let me put that one here. I'm going to put this one back for a reason. Um, now I'm going to look at this one and this one and see if these are William Spratling, because I think they, yes. Okay, here we go. Now I remember. You know, I haven't touched these for, boy, it's been maybe 15 years since I've seen this tray, uh, and um, I'm, not, I'm not proud of that, but uh, it's the truth. This one, yes. Okay, so now, construction-wise, we have two dragonfly brooches by William Spratling. And unfortunately, the little one is not signed with a WS mark, but you can tell that these are the same exact construction and the same exact pin backs and the same exact everything. So this not being signed William Spratling, someone would say, well, it's not William Spratling. Yeah, it absolutely 195% is William Spratling. Same exact everything. Same pin, same spring mechanism, same finish, same everything, uh, same rivets, same 100%. So there is the baby version. And here is the William Spratling hallmark there, WS. It's a little, little, uh, a little faint, but there you go. WS, the scrolled WS, and it's right there. WS, that's the scrolled WS, William Spratling. That's the later mark, meaning closer to our time period. And still very collectible. As William Spratling dragonflies, I will say I would sell them as a pair because they came together, same estate. Um, this one, I believe, was worn a lot more than this one because the patination is so different. But the uh, wings are tortoiseshell and then inset with these silver dots that then were riveted through the back. So the design element to hold the, um, the, the tortoiseshell in place was to be accentuated with these rivets 
And I think I, I blundered that, but that's okay. The brain is slowly but surely shutting off. Um, so there you go. Um, there we have it. Um, and after all, it's Friday night, so I should be able to take a break, and and I'm going to this evening. Now, um, let me look. Okay, we'll talk about this one, just because I want to. This one is glass and brass, and it's just a beetle. But look at how they constructed this. I would guess that this is Czechoslovakian. That's my best guess on this one. But it is Victorian. It is an original. And that's purple glass. And it's just uh, beautiful glass that is inset in brass. And I loved this little beetle. I, I just loved it. And a rare survivor. This one was a dollar or two dollars at a thrift store. And I was so excited because I, I, I said to myself, I'm never going to sell that. And I never will. Um, let's look at this one. Uh, this one is Paste Stones. I paid an awful lot for this. I paid $800 for this at an auction. Um, me and a gentleman uh, that was from Russia really got into it on this. It's 800 silver, um, and he really wanted it really bad, but um, I hate to say it this way. I wanted it worse. <laughs> so I did. I really wanted this. Uh, I wanted this so bad, but this is all Paste Stones, so Paste Rhinestones and Sterling Silver, and I just loved this. You know, was it worth $800? Mmm... Uh, on its best day, <laughs> on its very best day, it's worth 800. So again, um, don't be afraid to pay up for things if you love them, you know, and you don't have to buy for resale every single time you buy something. But my emotions got the best of me that day. And I, I love it. And I've worn this an awful lot. And every time I wear it, I mean, I definitely got my $800 worth of wear out of it. Um, some might say that those are emeralds in the wings. They're they're not. Those are definitely still glass, but uh, beautiful. And, you know, at first, I would have thought they were green garnets. And, and they're not. Uh, we we tested them, and they sure tested as glass. So uh, definitely not uh, not green garnet like I wish they were. Uh, Demitoid garnet. If they were, boy, that brooch would have been worth, you know, $11,000. Um, now, this is one of the largest Plikajur enamel scarabs that I have. This is Egyptian. And uh, the Egyptian hallmarks are on the back. That's 830 silver. And uh, simple, simple, simple clasp on that end. And uh, a very early... Uh, extended tube uh, hinge on this side, but look at that enameling. Um, I wish I could get light through this, but when you get light through this, I wish I could, and I just can't. I don't have a light strong enough. Uh, I'm looking. No, I, I, well, no, that's not going to cut it. I'm looking for a light, and I just don't have it, but look at the size of this. I think this is four and a half inches, a wingtip to wingtip, uh, but again, the grace and, and the beauty and the purple to almost like a peridot green, absolutely exquisite winged scarab Egyptian. My, 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 absolutely lovely. Oh, okay, I can't leave this one out. Uh, this is Garnets, Bohemian Garnets, a butterfly. I bought this maybe, oh boy, I bought this one five or six years ago and I paid very little, $40. And uh, again, this one as a as a butterfly and a figure of a butterfly with Bohemian garnets. Mm, I'm going to be careful and say 275. You know, and maybe 250, uh, but definitely 250, 275. It's not gold; it's plated. But the construction, very, very old. You know, extremely early tube hinge on that side, and just a C rollover on that side, and uh, the grace and the gesture. I really loved this one. That made me very happy. Um, I do have another larger version of that. I'll be willing to get that out eventually. I just didn't have access to it now. This is a necklace. I think it was converted. Yep, we've got a yeah, we got a conversion and not a very good one at that. Not sure exactly what we had going on here, but it was probably a brooch to start life. And now we just have a really ugly wire wrapped around the insect's neck. So a uh, very, very poor, very, very poor way to do that. But it makes it wearable as a necklace. So I'll, I'll forgive it. I'll stop being mean. <laughs> uh, this is an enameled body, half pearls, real pearls. And this, look at that stone. Absolutely incredible. And look at the eyes. The glow of this piece and being a bee or a bumblebee, uh, again, uh, the detail on the feet, look at the detail on the feet, and then uh, the detail of the wings, and I loved this so much, but as a necklace, it's beautiful. You know, it does it does lay down really beautifully well as a necklace, so I will forgive the um, early, uh, or I should say the um, unattractive <laughs> conversion on that one. My, 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 my hands are so dried out, I have got to take care of my hands before tomorrow's video. Uh, let me make sure that I didn't forget anything. 
Um, okay, two more. Mm, oh boy, I, I wish I could do four more, but I'm gonna do two more and then I'm gonna call it a night. Um, so blue morpho butterfly wing and, you know, how odd to be, you know, blue morpho butterfly and, and be the wings of a butterfly and the wings of a dragonfly. Um, these two, boy, oh boy, oh boy, the grace and the beauty and the construction, um, you know, early, purist, made in England. Um, hmm, I, I, boy, I, I could talk about these for a long time too, based on construction, design, aesthetic, gracefulness, but I'll just let you take them in. So that's a butterfly wing underneath glass. And those are, are, are glass shaped wings. And look at the depth of color and uh, beautiful. And they're very large, you know, um, they're, they're not by any stretch small. And I love that the butterfly wing was in such good condition. I think this was the one that stole my heart. I think that's the one that swooped in, it flew in, and now it lands on my shoulder every once in a while. Um, and it brings me luck. For some reason, some of these things bring me such good luck and, and they make me extremely happy. And it doesn't make me better than anyone, but it makes me happy. Um, and it, it, it brings me joy. And I hope showing you these things brings you an immeasurable amount of joy because it does for me. So I'll leave those two in there to kind of sing you on your way out. Thank you so much. Zoom in. Thank you so, so much for being here. Thank you for all your, your kindness. Again, I think I have two more days left to go, um, but I'm still going to be doing, um, I think I'm still going to go with daily videos for a while. So we'll see how that works out. Might take a few days off uh, and give you a break, but um, I still read all of the comments. So please keep the comments coming. Thank you so, so much from the bottom of my heart. Um, I, I appreciate you. You know that I do. And I, I absolutely love you very much. So thanks again.